Mary Griffin, president of ITM Trading. With me, I have Lynette Zhang, our chief market analyst. For those of you who don't know or tune in for the first time, we take your questions that you submit to us via email to questions at itmtrading.com. Take them, put them on the screen right here in front of us. We ask them live so you get a real, true, spontaneous, organic response. Yep. I was looking at these questions. Some of them look, they look good. Good. You ready for the first one? I'm ready. All right. Phil G asks, Okay. since there's a small percentage of U.S. citizens currently holding physical gold, mm -hmm. what would be the purpose in a government confiscation? Power, forcing citizens into one money standard. What's your thoughts? Well, first of all, whoever holds the gold has the power. So it would be about uh, our government. Part of it would be about building the reserves in gold. I mean, it hasn't changed even by a sixteenth of an ounce since I think what 1952 or 1954. Right. So it's questionable how much they actually have, but um, and so that would be one of the reasons why they would confiscate to build their gold reserves, just like they did back in 33. Um, another of it is to force the citizens into just the one monetary standard also makes sense because they've been confiscating our wealth since the day we were born. Just look on the purchasing power chart. The day you were born, it had the most purchasing power and then after that. So I think part of it is uh, or would be to take away that power because when you hold physical gold outside of the system, then it does not run any geopolitical risk. It protects you from inflation. It protects you. It's the only asset that runs no counterparty <laughs> risk. So they want as much of your wealth as they can keep in the system, in the system. That's why I only do collectibles. Because, because they've been exempt before in the past. Exactly. From the confiscation. I, I get asked this from friends um, a lot about this very topic, and we've covered it on the channel before. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, you know, I always thought, well, could a confiscation happen? You know, maybe, maybe not. What would be the reason behind it? You know, we're not on a gold standard anymore. That the last time they did it, we were on a gold standard. It allowed them to print more money. So maybe, maybe it gives a mm -hmm. maybe. It says that there won't be, but with the new advent of CBDCs, to me, if there was an argument for the reason why, you know, bullion gold may be confiscated is because it shuts down an exit route exactly, out of central bank digital currencies, right? So does cash. If they get rid of cash, they get rid of other cryptos, they get rid of gold as an option for you to flee CBDCs, right? And get into some other monetary yep. escape route shut them down, right? And then make it so that CBDCs is the only answer. Yep. Yep. I, I agree with that a hundred percent because it really is about power and control and CBDCs give them a whole lot po more power 100%. and a whole lot more control. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it used to be when I, in, inside of the system or inside of the strategy, I had <laughs> intended to convert a chunk, not all of it. I'll, I'd never do all of it because every portfolio should always have that foundation. But I would have done a larger chunk of it after the reset when they had a component of gold in the system. But with the CBDCs, right. there's no flipping way that I'm going to do that. No way, because it'll just it makes it easier for them to rob you and and who yeah. you're going to complain to. Right. So yeah, makes it, uh, but that's why I like the collectibles. It's in a different category. It's in the category, we, you know, even the, though this is probably just a couple, 3,000 bucks, whatever it is, 4,000, whatever it is, but it's in the same category as someone that's spending like 15 million on a coin. That's the category that I want. So if I can hold it inside of an IRA, not buying it because that's where most of the gold that the citizens hold is actually inside of IRAs. That's easy to do a sweep. Yeah, and if for ever, whatever reason they ever wanted to have a, a mon like the new monetary dollar or whatever backed by gold in some capacity. Right? Correct. Even correct. if it was a little bit, and the, and would the, also be another reason for a confiscation, right? To take the monetary right. gold to back it 
on some level because you always talk about exactly. if they if they lose if everybody loses total confidence and faith in a currency. That's what happens. One of the ways to to reinstill that confidence is to back it with a monetary metal. Well, and just <coughs> to that point, that's what's happened a hundred percent of the time mm -hmm. when all confidence in the currency is gone. And this is how you're going to know that they're done resetting the currency because they will put a component of gold in it, whether it's through the SDR or the US dollar, or, you know, however they're going to do it. But there will be a component of gold in there so that people have confidence in the currency again. And, oh, OK, well, then we can use it. And then they'll start to whittle it away. But yeah, I mean, that's the way they've done it 100 percent of the time. So while we can't guarantee the future, Typically, if something's happened 100 percent of the time and they're doing the same things again, what's the most likely outcome? We've, we've got over 4,800 currencies that we can look at the data on and say, oh, OK. So, right. yeah, absolutely. All right. So Justin B. asks, how will my retirement accounts be affected by a currency reset or hyperinflation? Well, first of all, you know, understand hyperinflation, the currency loses all value, but they would translate it into the new currency because they're not going to want you to realize that, I mean, you're obviously going to know through the pain, but if you have, it depends on how you have it invested. I mean, stock markets will drop a substantial amount, but they don't 100% disappear even through hyperinflation, right? So it would just be revalued into whatever that next currency is. And that's most, most likely what's going to happen to your retirement accounts. But the reality is, is they won't have any purchasing power value because we're, they're going to reset that purchasing power value to regain confidence. And I don't know how many times they're going to do it. Globally, on average, it's three. But in Venezuela, so far, it's been four. So it could be four, it could be two, it, who knows? We'll, we'll know when we get there. So yeah, it'll just be reset into the new, into the new currency. I personally don't hold any visible retirement accounts where, and I don't own any stocks or bonds or annuities or any of that stuff because I understand them too well, but I do have retirement, but it's in this that I hold and I control. All right, so Phil K asks, why are the central banks so afraid of deflation? Okay, because the system is based upon, upon constantly expanding the money supply. The money supply in the current system is created by creating debt. So in deflation, what you're doing is you're taking the money out of the system instead of inflation. It's the same coin, inflation, deflation, it's just the opposite side. So they have a whole lot less control over a deflationary environment. Well, we'll see how much control they actually even have over an inflationary environment. But deflation, just like paying off debt, it takes money out of the system and therefore they have less control. So that's why they don't like deflation because they want it, they want to be in absolute control all the time. Right. And and until and until, right, um, like central bank digital currencies, cashless society, deflation is harder to fight because you can't lower interest rates Good low point. enough. Thank if you. once you get to zero, you can't lower them enough to to then inspire more spending. They've already seen this, right? It gets down to right. zero and then we're kind of just there. But if we can go CBDCs and we can go cashless, then they can go negative on the interest rates. And then it's easier for them to fight the deflation because then they could go, they have, they have tools on both sides, right? You have the zero, higher, higher interest rates fights inflation, lower interest rates fights deflation. So you can go in and fight it. So they might not be as afraid of deflation once we get to that other side where they can well, really go negative as they want. Exactly. <clears throat> and that's what they keep saying when you read it. Now, they won't do it right away, but they are not really talking about fully getting rid of cash because the perception would be that something has changed and they don't really want you to realize that anything has changed. It's just that in the new cash, there'll be a chip in there so that whenever you go to use it, redeposit it, what have you, it will reflect the same negative rate 
as as the bank account would. Yeah, which makes sense. We, absolutely. I mean, really, they like to keep things as close to what you would think of as normal as possible. <laughs> until, so that, until they phase it out completely and no one knows and it was history. And the, exactly. And cash, was it's just a relic of the past. Yeah, that's right. It is just like the the five thousand dollar bill, the one thousand dollar bill, the five hundred dollar bill. People don't realize that we used to have those, and they used to circulate in the normal marketplace, and it was an easy way to move a lot of money. Did they demonetize them? No, they didn't. They simply took them out of circulation via when anybody made a deposit, they were not given out again. So we don't even realize that they've been moving in this direction. And and look at what we have now. A hundred dollar bill is the largest bill yeah, and that it doesn't, we have. And it just doesn't buy like a hundred dollar bill used to be a lot of money. Yeah. Right? Even thirty years ago, a hundred dollar bill, you know, bought you thirty gallons of gas. What's it buy now? Twenty. <laughs> yeah, not much. <clears throat> hey, twelve thousand dollars a year. Did I say I said a hundred dollar bill bought you a hundred gallons of gas? Yes. Right, back in the nineties. Now it buys you twenty. Oh, I can, I hate to say this, but I don't. I mean, I don't mind admitting my age anyway. There used to be this really cute guy at the gas station, and this was the days when you pulled in and they would, you know, wash your windshield wiper and check your oil and all that. Then he was really cute, and I didn't have a gas gauge that worked on my on my car, right? So we would accidentally go in with a quarter, twenty five cents, and get a gallon of gas. And I accidentally drop it. <laughs> You're funny. You are funny. How old were you? I, uh, you know, like 16, 17 years old. That's cute. Like that. Yeah, it was cute. And he was cute. He was very cute. That's really. He cute. might even know who it is if he happens to be watching this. That's really cute. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, twenty five cents a gallon. Now I know why you're dropping quarters around here all the time. <laughs> well, there are a lot of cute young men here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, we're on John S. <clears throat> okay. John mm -hmm. S. asks, can you explain how gold can protect purchasing power either a, in a deflationary or inflationary economy? That is really a, a fabulous <coughs> question. You okay? Yep. Okay. That is a fabulous question. Um, obviously, we know what it is in inflation because it holds your purchasing power. And the same would be true in in deflation because in deflation, the money actually has more value. You can buy more things with it. But when you look back in periods of both inflation and deflation and you watch the value of gold, it maintains it. So it stabilizes your purchasing power either way. And at that during the deflationary period of time, you have a choice of what you're going to use. And the good money or the bad money, like the fiat money, chases out the good money, right? Because people have a tendency to hoard it and to hold on to it because they understand what's happening. But either way, it protects your purchasing power and it puts you in a position because you can always convert it into the current currency. But in deflation, then you, the money buys you more. And I'll bring it back as for another example for you, to, a different way for you to think about it, um, to my previous example with negative interest rates. If, right. if the central banks are using, in a deflationary environment, they would use negative interest rates to force you to spend, spend money. money. Thank you. Right? So you're going to lose your money by um, holding it. Right? So you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna spend it. Well. In that type of environment, that deflationary environment, if you, you're going to want to escape into things that hold value. So you're going to buy gold during that period of time, which is going to increase demand, which is going to force prices to rise on the metal itself, and therefore maintaining your purchasing power actually increasing it in a deflationary environment. So it's another way of thinking about it. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, Mike G., how might corporate and municipal bonds fare as the dollar problems escalate, i.e. inflation, loss of reserve currency status, push to CBDCs, etc., and once the reset happens. So how might corporate and municipal bonds fare as the dollar problems escalate? <clears throat> well, first of all, you got to look at interest rates because this is the big problem right now as the interest rates are rising. Remember, when you're looking at valuations for corporations or municipalities or banks or anything, the value of those bonds is based on interest rates. And can I have a pen, please? 
Thank you. Okay. So if this is the bond that's issued, right? And this is interest rates. These are interest rates. This is the principal value. What we, the problem that the banks and corporations in terms of their valuation, right? In rising interest rate environment, the assets that they hold that are denominated in dollars um, are going down. So like First Republic is a great example. The banks rushed in, gave them 30 billion to stabilize their balance sheet till they could get themselves sold or otherwise fixed. Except that when they go to find a buyer because their holdings have so much less value that it doesn't really get them out of the hole. So it impacts the bonds, whether it's corporate or municipal or treasury or, or any other debt, could be a mortgage as well. Any debt instrument is definitely impacted one way or the other by interest rates, either up or down. And the longer it is, in other words, the longer to maturity it is, and you can see this in here, the greater that fluctuation. So how might they fare, fare in dollar problems? Well, that's we right now we do have a big dollar problem and we are losing our status as the world reserve currency. So it's a double whammy because this is going to impact the value of the bond, but the loss of uh, the inflation or deflation or all those dollars coming back home and the demand loosening also means that whatever dollars you do end up with have a whole lot less value. Did that make sense? Well, so <clears throat> explain it more in terms of how are those bonds going to, what's, what's going to happen to them? So let's they're, take they're it. They're going to lose a lot. Let's they, take it. They are losing a lot of value. Each thing I think might re okay. require a different explanation. Okay. So let's say there's inflation or hyperinflation. How do you think it affects? Well, absolutely. The bonds have a lot less value, period. They have a lot less N value. Not only in purchasing power, but also if interest in rates principle. have to be risen to fight massive amounts of inflation or... Which is exactly what's happening right now. Force the price down. Forces the price down. Now, if all of these, and this is what we've got coming up with SOFR and LIBOR, that transition as well, right? Because no matter what happens with the interest rates, it's going to have an impact on the principal value of the mm -hmm. bond, right? So if they go down, like we've been in that environment with low interest rates, and then what did the corporations and the banks loaded up on a lot of the debt, right? So where it looked like it was worth more money, so they could even take on more debt and leverage everything even more. Now they're in the reverse. Right. Okay. So there's there's a problem with the bonds. It depends on who's holding them, but if an individual is holding them, it's a double whammy because it's both the principal and the purchasing power that you'd even get back for it. If it's a corporation, um, and remember, banks are corp private corporations then their valuation is based on the value of the bond. That's, that was the difference between those bonds that didn't have to be valued to the market because they're going to hold them to maturity, except there's an awful lot of them. So with, <clears throat> with the environment where they held the interest rates near zero for so long and these corporations loaded up on those bonds, they've got a really big problem in the valuation. And when we go to the SOFR from the LIBOR, those companies that have not yet made that shift, even though it's pennies, remember we did, well, we didn't do the calculation, but, you know, I did the calculate or I found the calculations and how SOFR compares to LIBOR. And even though they put in fixes and th synthetic fixes, they still have not been able to get the pricing structure exactly the same. So if you just have one or two bonds, it's not that big a deal because there's, it's not that much off. But if you've got a large portfolio, that is like an overnight valuation reset. So we've got that coming up and we'll see how they're going to fare through that. I mean, it's a big experiment. Right. Well, and yeah, I, I like what you said is like you can hold the bonds to maturity, right? And then you're not as affected. Like if you sold a lot of bonds and you sold them at 0%, you could hold them to maturity, but it creates a liquidity problem. 
Yes, right? it because does. Because you can't sell them off. And exactly. That's, and that's what that's, that's what was creating a massive, a big portion of the problem. And there might be a lot of, I think, systemic risk that's underneath that we're, oh. that it's being papered over right now and we don't see the cracks that are really happening because the yeah. raising of the interest rates causing a lot of these um, problems with a lot of banks, a lot of pension funds because they're holding bonds that maybe are at 2% with rates at 5 and now the value, like Lynette shows, the price on this side with the interest rates rising, now the values are down here and you can't sell them off without taking a big loss. But it also creates a liquidity problem because you can't sell them. Exactly. Thank you. That's a great so it point. gets it gets uh, it's it's a very tricky situation. Now in the short term, if you bought bonds this year and maybe you bought them at five percent, and the Fed has to cut rates at the end of 2024, now your bond prices might rise, right? But if hyperinflation comes into play, if even if you're selling them out here at this higher price, what's it really going to buy? And that's what Lynette's always trying to point to is, yeah, you might be able to sell this for a lot more money, but what happens if $100 is really only worth 50 now, right? right? Or 10. And, and, and to that <clears throat> point, taking that one more step further, right? Because now we are seeing a lot of the traders going into the bond market, leaving the stock market, going into the bond market exactly for that reason, because they think the Fed is going to have to shift. Mm -hmm. However, and, and they will shift, but that will, I think, finalize the entry to the hyperinflation, which is then going to turn around and force that hand. So you're going to see a lot more. I mean, we are already seeing a lot more defaults because to your point, the lack of liquidity in these markets and with the Fed on the course that they are right now, which is running, trying to run off their balance sheet. I mean, it's kind of a joke and oh, maybe they'll do a quarter point, which isn't really going to do very much. Yeah, it's, it's, well, a it's really it's more like prop, uh, pre, um, postponing. No, no, no. What you always say, perception management, perception management. It's just trying to man manage the perception of we're going to keep going after inflation, even though they know that these quarter percent rate hikes aren't going to do anything, but they're in a rock and a hard place because if they raise them more, they could cause more systemic risks with all these underlying products that people own, all these bonds yeah. and these derivatives. Right. And these yeah. corporations that loaded up on zero interest rate debt, but then have to reset into a new bond at a significantly higher rate, if they're even going to do that, I mean, there, there's just no way around this. It doesn't matter what they do, yeah. raise rates, lower rate. It doesn't matter what they do. They are a hundred percent obviously between a rock and a hard place. Well, I think that's why they want a recession. They want the recession to come because the recession is going to force labor. There's going to be job losses. It'll yeah. reduce the spending. It'll reduce and the recession will start to solve the inflation problem and they won't have to continue to raise interest rates to do it. So then they'll be able to eventually pivot right? They'll be able to cut the rates when they, when they need to cut the rates because the recession will have wiped out a lot of this inflation. Um, but it still goes right back to, we have a debt problem. And by now cutting the rates and putting more money into the system, you're just, you're exacerbating now the debt problem that we have. And it's, maybe, maybe it kicks the can down the road longer. But, but here's the thing. <clears throat> Let's talk about that can kicking piece, mm -hmm. right? Because if there is virtually officially no purchasing power left, then what are you kicking the can to? Well, my thinking is that they kick the can so they, they avoid the crisis until they have these control pieces that they're they, trying to right, get. Right, right. The control that's that you what are always talking about, they're trying to get right. in place, right? right? And use that crisis then to make sure that the CBDCs and all this stuff is in place where they have the total control. That, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether or not, I hope they can't pull it off, right? That's my goal is that enough people recognize what's happening. Yeah, it's going to take that. Vote with their purses, right? So, and they see that, well, guess what? Then they lose. And, you know, the CPTCs, when you look at the countries that have instituted them, it hasn't been as easy and smooth as they thought it was going to be. So, I don't know. We live in the most interesting times. Well, in this whole perception management thing, you look at, like, these... these um I forget what it's called. They have, there's like a, a think tank or a, a group that's in charge of right now, like investigating the probabilities uh, that the government is contracted to investigate how good, or how, you know, how are these CBDCs going to be? And it's all positives. Like I don't, anything right. they put out publicly doesn't, there's no negatives 
that they point out. So they're, tr- they're just trying to spin it in this way that it's gonna be great, it's gonna be so helpful. Oh, it's gonna be so convenient. Yeah. How uh, convenient so is it? Yeah, well, and and people but, are, you know, people are gullible. <laughs> I mean, I remember 1971. Not the people on our channel. No, exactly. But I, I remember 1971, and, and I'm sure a lot of you remember that too. And did you realize like anything four. changed? No, I wasn't. <laughs> No, I'm glad say, I yes. wasn't for. Nah. You know, um, I was like, how old was I in 1970? I graduated high school in 1972. So I would have been, been probably 16. Yeah, I graduated yep. when I was 17. So I'd have been like yep. 16, 17 years old. That's old enough to remember that period of time, which is why I'm glad I was not four years old. Well, then. you had your Uncle Al. I, oh, my Uncle Al. Thank was, God for my was, Uncle Al. Who was kind of ahead of the time, right? He so. was way ahead of the time. But I, I can't say that even at 16, 17, he was training me. That, that's what that whole big piece was. Um, he was training me. I, I, and I, I definitely trusted him. You know, I can't say that I fully understood what was going on then. And even he didn't fully understand it. Because they'd meet every, every Friday night, Aunt Bertie, Uncle Al, Aunt Dan <coughs> and Uncle Ali would come over and they would play penny poker. So, and I would listen to them. Which could have bought a house back then. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> My father built a very nice house and still, you know, $12,000. They that, that couple that bought that house, he was making way above average. He was a comer. My mother said, he's a comer. He's a comer. He makes $12,000 a year. And then that's... Yeah. I mean, what would happen if you made $12,000 a year today? You, you go to, you'd be in high school working part-time. Yeah. And and it, barely afford to pay your gas. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I mean, it it's tough. So. Hey, Edgar, will you do me a favor and send the live questions since we're way over on time? Yep. Send them to me and I'll, I'll look at them for next week. Sorry about that. But make sure that you do Excuse watch me. yesterday's <coughs> new headline news. Bank collapses expose weakness in financial sector and what you need to know. It is critically important for you to understand everything. And if you don't, just send it, just send the question into questions at itmtrading.com. Also, I'm so excited about what's happening in our Thrivers community. So you want to make sure and check this out. But it's a place for like-minded people to come together. And what is so heartwarming is how much help everybody is giving each other, which is exactly what we were hoping for. So we worked on it a long time. And and I, I also want to say, yesterday we did our first um, Zoom live chat. So everybody was there. And it wasn't just a question and answer for me. It was, uh, there was certainly that. But it was also a lot of, of helping each other in there and open discussion. So I thought it went really well. I hope those that joined us thought, felt like it went really well. And we're always open to making it better and better and better because this is a community for you where you can come with like-minded people so you don't feel so alone, right? So you can find that on uh, the Thrivers Community app in the App Store or on Google Play, and you or you can also sign up at thriverscommunity.com. It's the Thrivers Community, right? The. The thriverscommunity.com? Thrivers. No. It's thriverscommunity.com. Thrivers Community. Right. But the, the app is the Thrivers Community. Got it. <clears throat> okay. And don't forget to subscribe to our Beyond Gold and Silver channel where we talk about all the other pieces of the mantra. The wealth piece you get here, and that's critically important, but the other food, etc. So what we're really trying to do with that channel is meet you where you are to help you be prepared and have a holistic approach and strategy. And speaking of the strategy. Well, hold on. So I wanted to say, too, there's all, we also have our ITM Trading Insights channel um, where we put questions and answers, like the best Q&As for people to find answers to. So if you're looking oh, for yeah. an answer to something, maybe it's already been a- answered in one of our Q&As that we've been doing for six years now we've been doing, seven years we've been doing these Q&As. And we, so there's a whole backlog of just questions and answers on the ITM Trading Insights channel. So use that as a resource. Yeah, that's that, that's great. I'm glad that you brought that up. And if you haven't started your strategy yet, 
click that Calendly link below, set a time to meet with one of our consultants and set up your own personal gold and silver strategy that will encompass everything. It's critically important. They got a plan, you need a plan. And if you haven't yet, Make sure you subscribe, especially these days when so much information and so many things are happening. We need to keep you in that loop. You need to be in that loop. Leave us a comment, give us a thumbs up, and share, share, share. Because the fact is, financial shields are made of physical gold and physical silver in your possession. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.